Good morning. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 is where I'm going to start. So good to see everybody this morning. As I've been announcing this week, in this hour, I want to take a look especially uh, at a topic that should be of interest to those who are younger. So to our younger people, I'm going to be speaking directly to you, but this is something that all of us can use. If it's from God's Word, we can use it. Uh, but I, I hope and trust that I especially have the attention of those who are younger. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, I want, to, I want to start in verse 9 and then read into chapter 12 and verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, starting at verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put evil away from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. The days of one's youth are an exciting time of life. I can say that from my vantage point, having already gone through that. It is a very exciting time of life. It's, it is a time for you to let your heart cheer you, as the text says. It's a time for you to see what is in the world, and a time for you to find your place in the world. It's also a time for you to be deciding what it is that you're going to do with your life. I remember when I was younger, I would be asked from time to time, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? I had some ideas. Preaching was not anywhere in uh, the scope of things I was looking at when I was younger. But I had some ideas. But now I realize I was asked that question because those who were older knew I was going to have to do something with my life. Am I thinking about that? Am I looking toward that? To those who are younger, are you thinking about that? It's important that you look ahead and make some plans for what you want to do with your life. Uh, what career do you want? Is it going to require some education? If so, are you getting ready for college? Are you getting ready to go to a trade school, to an apprenticeship, whatever it may require for you to have that career? What about marriage? We studied last night and saw that marriage takes work. Are you preparing yourself now to be the kind of man that a godly woman would want to marry? Are you preparing yourself now to be the kind of young lady that a godly man would desire and want to marry? Are you working toward that? What are your goals in life? You know, it's important that you look towards these things that are going to take place, Lord willing, in this physical life but I want to tell you, turning to Matthew chapter 16, it's even more important that you be planning for your spiritual life. In Matthew chapter 16, and at verse 26, Jesus asked a couple of rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions are not questions that are meant to be answered. They're questions that are meant to get us thinking. And that's what Jesus does with these questions. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? See? These questions are meant to get you thinking. Whatever it is that you're going to do with your life and in your life, I wish you success. I hope you achieve great things with your life. But I want you to realize that when that life is over, whatever successes you have had, whatever achievements that you've made, whatever records there are of those achievements, they're going to be gone. They're going to be burned up. And you're going to be before your Creator, and the only thing that you're going to have is your soul. And on that day, the only thing that's going to matter is that you have prepared an eternal resting place for your soul. Nothing else will matter. So this verse tells us that while it's important that you plan for your future here, it's even more important that you plan for eternity. 
if you think about it, that's what life really is all about. This physical life is about preparing for the next one and making sure that you're ready to enter into the next one. Success in anything takes work. Unless you're one of those few annoying people who can make straight A's without ever studying, it takes some work to make good grades in school. Whether you're homeschooled or public school, go on to college, you're going to have to spend some time studying. It takes some work. It doesn't just happen. You watch sports on television, professional sports. Those athletes make it look easy, but it's not easy. We don't see the hours that they put in every day training for that game, getting ready for that game, not to mention their entire lives they have spent up to that point training themselves and getting ready to compete in that game. Whether it be professional sports, it be the Olympics, whatever it is, it's not easy. In business, I'm not a businessman, and I guess there is some luck involved in business, but luck favors the prepared, right? It takes some smarts, it takes some works. Whatever field you're in, to enjoy success takes some work. It doesn't just happen. And I hope the young people here are smart enough not to, not to buy into that idea that it's going to just be handed to you. That's not reality. No, to succeed at anything, you're going to have to apply yourself. You are going to have to work. And there's nothing more important than being a spiritual success. Think about this. Going back with our, our study that we had on Friday night, if a person achieves great things with their life here, they have all kinds of trophies, set all kinds of records, they have an enormous bank account, and they die and go to hell, they're not a success. Nobody who dies and goes to hell is a success. We want you to be a success spiritually. We want heaven to be your home. Your parents do have a responsibility to bring you up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Yes, mom and dad have a responsibility, but young people, mom and dad can only take you so far. Eventually, you're going to have to go from there. Eventually, it's going to have to be your faith. It's going to have to be your commitment to the Lord. It's going to have to be you working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You are going to be responsible for your own choices and your own actions. See, you don't get to heaven on the family plan. That works with cell phones. But that doesn't work with heaven. God doesn't have any grandchildren. God only has children. Your parents are going to take you far. They're going to encourage you, but eventually it's going to have to be your own faith. What I want to do this morning, I want to take a look at three young individuals in the Bible who made some decisions early in their life that paid great dividends for them spiritually. And we're going to learn from these three individuals and we're going to look at some decisions, some choices that you need to make now in your youth that will set you up for spiritual success in your life now and in the life to come. Let's start by looking at young King Josiah. Turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and at verse 3 we're going to read for in the eighth year of his reign while he was still young he began to seek the God of his father David and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places the wooden images, the carved images and the molded images. Here we're introduced to, to Josiah and we're told something about, about the eighth year of his reign. What do we know about Josiah so far? What do we know about him right here? Let's stop and, and let's consider first, this is a young man. 
Josiah is a young man at this point. The text says that it was in the eighth year of his reign. When did his reign begin? You back up to the first verse. It says Josiah was eight years old when he became king and reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. So he's eight years old when he starts. In the eighth year of his reign, I went to school in Arkansas, but I believe I can handle eight plus eight is 16. He's 16 years old. He's a young man. Notice also, he's not just a young man, but the text indicates his reign. He is a king. He is reigning as king. Now, I remember what it was like to be 16 years old. Most of us here know what that's like. None of us know what it's like to be a king. None of us can comprehend that kind of responsibility. And I have no doubt that as an 8-year-old and even as a 16-year-old, Josiah had a lot of help. There were probably a lot of people who were looking over the administrative affairs of his reign. But nonetheless, he was not your average 16-year-old, was he? He had a lot of responsibility. There's something else we can learn about Josiah, and I believe it's important for us to understand. He didn't come from the best home life. If you back up into chapter 33, we read about his father, Ammon. 2 Chronicles 33, let's look at verses 21 through 25. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. Pause right there. We've got an evil man, and he's only getting worse, right? That was his father. That was Josiah's father. Look how bad it got. Verse 24, Then his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. Josiah, what was it like for you growing up? Well, I remember when I was about eight years old, my father was murdered by his own servants in his own house. That's what Josiah came from. He had evil modeled for him by his father. But despite his youth and despite his busyness and his responsibilities in that youth and despite his background, Josiah began to seek the God of his father, David. That was the right choice for him to make. That was a choice that set him up for spiritual success. Josiah is looked upon as one of the good kings of Judah. His reign came too late to, to save Judah but he is honored as one of the good kings of Judah. He sought the Lord. That's the good decision he made. What does it mean to seek the Lord? Why is it important? And why is it a decision that you as a young Christian, you as a young person need to be making? Well, if we look at the first king, good king rather, look at the first good king, David, in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9, this is David preparing his son Solomon to take reign. Because David knows he's going to die. He knows Solomon's going to take his place. So here's some fatherly advice he's giving to his son, the next king of Israel. He says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, you'll be found, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. I believe in this verse, we have a good explanation of what it means to seek the Lord. First, Solomon is told to know the Lord. To know the God of your father. And that's more than just having a factual knowledge that there is a God. What David is telling Solomon is that you need to come to know God personally as I have. You need to understand who God is and how God thinks and what God requires of you, what angers God and what pleases God. You need to come to understand those things about God. For you, God needs to become more than just the God of your parents. He needs to become your God. 
You need to strive to develop your own faith, your own relationship with God based upon your own reading and your own study of God's Word. We look on in the text, it means to serve Him, to serve God, to put your life into action, to, to direct it toward God in doing the things that God tells you to do in His Word and to do it with a loyal heart, David says. That means you are committed to God. That God has your undivided attention. God will not accept second place in your heart. He either has first place or He has nothing. You serve God with a loyal heart, with an undivided devotion. You serve God with a willing mind. Your, your faith is not that you do things because you have to do them. Oh, it's Sunday. We've got to go to church. No. It's not I have to. It's I want to. I want to worship God. I want to serve Him. I want to please Him with my life. Seeking the Lord is the opposite of forsaking the Lord. And we understand what it means to forsake. To forsake means to turn away from, to abandon. We talk about forsaking the assemblies. Forsaking the Lord means you turn your back on God and you abandon Him. Don't do that. Turn toward God. Walk toward God. Learn more about God. Learn how to please Him. I want to encourage you to do this with your life as David encouraged his son. Because... David's grandson, Solomon's son, failed in this effort. The text says in 2 Chronicles 12, verses 13 and 14 of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, thus King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Now Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And he did evil. He did evil. Why? Because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Look at the difference that makes. That, that one decision that we're talking about right here, right now. Look at the difference that it makes. Josiah sought the Lord God. And he was a good king. And he pleased God. Rehoboam did not prepare his heart to seek God. And he did evil. He did evil. So we're talking about something that is very simple, but yet it's something that has an incredible impact on your life today and on into eternity. You need to seek God. The decision you make about whether or not to seek God, to come to know Him, to develop your own personal relationship with Him will determine whether or not you are a success spiritually. So be like Josiah in the days of your youth to be determined to seek the Lord God. Secondly, let's go a little bit ahead in the history of Israel. Let's go and consider Ezra. And consider some lessons we can learn from Ezra. Ezra was a skilled scribe. He was a very important leader of God's people during the time of their return from captivity and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Now Ezra was not the governor, he was not the political or civic leader, and he was not the high priest, but he was their spiritual leader. And that didn't happen by accident. They didn't put his name in, in a bag and draw it out and say, Ezra, come on down here and be our leader. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because Ezra prepared himself for that. In Ezra chapter 7 and at verse 10 we read, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Ezra was a successful man. But again, it wasn't by accident. Early in his life, he had made some choices and he had taken some steps to be in a position to be of service to God and be of service to God's people. I want to break this verse down and I want to look at what all is involved in this verse. Before we get to the specific things he did, just notice the general observation that he prepared his heart. Ezra prepared his heart. He knew what he was going to do and he prepared his heart to do it. To prepare your heart means that you have 
got your entire self involved in this matter. Uh, watch your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Everything that is important to us is going to come from the heart. It's going to be impacted by the heart. He prepared his heart. That means he got his entire self committed to this goal. The way we might put it today is we would say that Ezra was all in. He was all in. He was committed to pursuing this course. He gave every bit of himself to it. Are you all in to serving the Lord? Are you committed to serving the Lord? Let's go back and, and perhaps I can illustrate this a little bit better. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? Let's say this. Let's say you, you want to be able to fly a plane. You want to be a pilot. Okay, that's all right. Maybe a little scary for your mom to think about. But okay, you want to be a pilot. Have you thought about where you're going to get the training to do that? Are you going to go and enroll in a flight school somewhere? Have you looked at that? Are, they, are there any in the area? What would that involve? What, how much would that cost? Maybe not that. Maybe have you thought about the Air Force? Maybe going there and learning how to be a pilot? Have you talked to anyone who is a pilot? Have you asked them what, what is involved in that? What it's going to require? What you have to do beforehand? What you have to do as a pilot to stay in shape for that? How much it pays? Can you make a living doing that? Or is it just going to be a hobby? You haven't done any of that? Then I'd say that you haven't committed yourself to being a pilot. You're just toying with the idea. You see, if you're committed to doing something, you're going to search out how to do it. You're going to talk to people. You're going to find out what all is involved. When I first thought about becoming a full-time preacher, I pestered preachers to death. I'd call them. I'd say, let's have lunch. Can I spend some time with you? And I would throw questions at them one right after the other. I think they got the, go, just go preach, go preach. But I, I wanted to know. I wanted to know what all was involved. Do you, are you taking that attitude towards God? But you want to know. Or are you just along for the ride? No, you need to prepare your heart. You need to prepare your heart to seek the law of God. You're not going to be a success without preparation. You need to prepare your heart specifically in these areas to seek the law of the Lord. To seek the Lord means to strive to know God. We just saw that with Josiah. So to seek the law of the Lord means to strive to know and to understand God's Word. And that's going to require some study on your part. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Again, your parents can only take you so far. Your Bible class teachers, the preacher can only take you so far. You have to invest some of yourself in the study of God's word. It's one thing to read the word of God. To, to familiarize yourself with the word of God. Even to memorize some scriptures. But it's another thing to know what it says and what it means and how it works in your life. We are surrounded by people in the denominational world who know about Scripture. They've read the Word of God. Maybe even they've memorized some Scriptures. But they don't know what it means. How many people around about us can, can throw up Philippians 4.13 over and over again? Don't have a clue of the context in which it's taken from. Don't have a clue how to make the proper application to their lives. You need to know the Word of God. You need to handle it accurately. That takes some effort on your part. But it's worth it. Prepare your heart not just to seek the law of God, but to do it. See, Ezra, as he was searching the Scriptures, as he was seeking to know the law of God, it was not just an academic exercise for him. He wasn't preparing himself to win Bible trivia. He wanted to learn it so he could know what to do. He was going to make application of it to his life. There is no substitution for doing God's will. 
There's no substitution for obedience. James says in James chapter 1 and verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. There is no spiritual success without doing God's will. You know, in the, in the realm of, of uh, sports, there's a, there's a big gulf between the achievers and the pretenders. A lot of us are real good at Monday morning quarterbacking, right? The team doesn't win the game, boy, we're ready to rake them over the coals. Here's what they all did wrong. And if I was making as much money as that guy was making, I would have stretched out just a little bit further and I would have made that catch. Really? You really think you would have? Or if I was getting paid as much money as that baseball player is, I would have hit that fastball out of the park in the bottom of the ninth and had that walk-off home run. Really? Have you ever stood in a batter's box and hit a 98 mile an hour fastball coming at you? No. I've been told that's one of the most difficult things to do in sports. There aren't many people who can do it. There's a big difference between the doers and the wannabes. Be a doer spiritually. Step up and do it. In Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount, gives this great body of teaching which has stood the test of time as one of the greatest sermons ever preached. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Could we say that one was a success and the other was a failure? Yes, what made the difference? One was a doer of the word. The other one was not. Be a doer of the word. That's what Ezra prepared himself to do, but then teach it. It's not enough just to accumulate the knowledge of God's will and, and house it in your mind and in your heart and do it. You've got to share it. The religion of God has always been a taught religion. In the time of the patriarchs, God spoke to the fathers who taught the families. Under the law of Moses, the Levites were to teach God's law. Today, we are to go and make disciples and teach them to observe. The religion of God has always been a taught religion. We're always going to need teachers, preachers, Bible class teachers, personal workers. They must be prepared. These individuals don't succeed. They aren't successful by accident. I understand this congregation just a few months ago appointed elders. You're to be commended for that. That's a great thing. Young people, let's fast forward about 30 years. Yeah, that will transpire quickly. That will happen fast. This church is going to need elders. Where are they going to come from? The men who are serving as elders today didn't qualify by accident. It's a decision that they made a long time ago. And they started preparing themselves for it. Someday, the torch is going to be handed to your generation. And the Lord's church is going to need elders. And to be an elder, he has to have a qualified wife. Are you thinking now? Are you looking ahead now? Are you making decisions now that will prepare you and qualify you to serve as an elder or to qualify your husband to serve as an elder one day? It doesn't happen by accident. Prepare yourself now. Get, get ready now. If you want your life to matter, if you want your life to be a spiritual success, then be like Ezra. Make the determination now that you're going to know God's law, you're going to do it, and you're going to teach it to others. And that will put you far ahead towards spiritual success.
Let's take a look at the third individual, and that is Daniel. To be successful in anything, there are some things that you have to do. Josiah shows us that. Ezra shows us that. But there's also some things that you're going to have to avoid. You want to be a successful leader, you're going to have to avoid some things that would destroy your influence. Want to be a successful athlete? Well, the news shows us again and again athletes who ruin themselves one way or another there are some things you're going to have to avoid the same thing is true spiritually if you're going to be success spiritually there are some things that you're going to have to avoid in the book of James before we go to Daniel in the book of James at chapter 1 and verse 27 James says pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this to seek the Lord to know his word to do it and to teach it that's not, what, that's not what James says here. We've looked at that in other passages. That's important. But pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. To keep yourself unspotted, unsoiled, unstained from the world. It's impossible for you to walk through a pig pen and come out the other side unstained by accident. I'd say it's impossible to do it at all. But it's certainly impossible to walk through filth and come out the other side unstained if you're careless about it. This world is a filthy place. Your parents have tried their best to protect you and to keep that at bay, but eventually you're going to come into contact with the filth of the world. You need to, ter to determine now how you're going to handle that situation. Because it's essential. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. If we are going to maintain our fellowship with God, we must remain separate from the filth of the world. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. It doesn't happen by accident. You will not remain morally pure in this world by being careless, by accident, by counting on your parents to, to block all of that out of your way for your entire life. You're going to have to take responsibility for your life. You're going to have to take precautions. And you're going to have to learn how to tell yourself and to tell the world around you, no. That's exactly what Daniel did. Daniel was taken away from his home, likely taken away from his parents, taken away from everything that he knew, probably as a teenager, and thrust into a foreign environment that was filled with idolatry and filled with sin. But notice the determination. Notice the choice that Daniel made beforehand. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He had purposed in his heart, just like Ezra did, just like Josiah did, made a commitment. This is one thing I'm not going to do. I'm not going to defile myself. What this passage teaches us, helps us to understand, is that young people don't get a free pass from God. You don't get a free pass from God. Going back to Ecclesiastes 11 that we started with, Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the way of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. You will answer for the choices you make even as a young person. So make the determination now. You're not going to defile yourself. Doing so... Doing so will allow you to fulfill what verse 10 says. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. 
for childhood and youth are vanity. You want to spare yourself of some heartache and some sorrow and some regret? Then follow in the footsteps of Daniel and determine now that instead of going out there and tasting what the world has to offer, instead you're going to keep yourself separate from it. You're not going to be defiled with the world. The Amish, I understand, the Amish have a practice for the young people called Rumpspringer. I think is how it's pronounced. I don't speak German. But what they do is they allow their, pe their young people to go out and enjoy the world for a while. And if they decide they want to stay in the world, they can. But if they decide they want to come back and be Amish, then they have to come back and, and they leave the world out there behind and they're Amish. How foolish that is. You go out there and you get yourself filthy and you experiment with this and you try it and you get those pleasures and those memories burned into your heart and then try coming back in here and staying away from it. How foolish that is. God doesn't tell us to do that. Success in this area, keeping yourself separate from the world around you, is going to require great determination on your part. You're going to have to decide beforehand how you're going to react and respond to different situations. If you wait until a friend of yours hands you an open bottle of beer or a lit joint or some pills to take, if you wait till then to decide whether or not you're going to try that, you're setting yourself up for failure. But if you determine now, you decide now, I'm not going to drink alcohol, I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to take drugs, stick to that. It'll make it a lot easier for you to turn that down when and if it's ever offered to you. If you decide now that you're not going to lie, you're not going to steal, you're not going to cheat, that to make it a lot easier for you to stick to that than waiting until you're given that opportunity to cheat on a test in order to get a passing grade, or to slip something in your pocket that you want and can't afford, or you've gotten yourself into trouble and you're going to lie in order to get out of trouble. If you wait till then, you're not going to succeed. How about sinful entertainment, which abounds out there? If you, if you follow what your parents have taught you and you follow the standards that they have set, they've done it for a reason. Just like what Solomon writes in the book of Ecclesiastes, to save you from sorrow. Your parents have told you no about different things for a reason. Well, pretty soon you're going to be able to go out and you're going to be able to go to a movie with your friends. But you need to know ahead of time that that movie is rated R. It's rated R for a reason because it includes something that you have no business seeing. You have no business hearing, no business watching. And if you decide beforehand how you're going to react to that, your friends want to go see this movie, you know it's not something you need to be seeing, you say no. You say no and you spare yourself of having to see those images and hear those things and try to get them out of your heart and try to get them out of your mind. Or you decide that you're going to keep yourself pure and you're going to save yourself for marriage. It's going to make it a lot easier when you find yourself on a date with someone and you really care about them and they really care about you and all of a sudden you're in a private place that's secluded where you're not going to be disturbed and you're not going to be interrupted and pretty soon things get to the point that You've not saved yourself. And it happens just that fast. No, be like Daniel and make the decision now that you are going to keep yourself pure. Your parents are telling you. Your parents are setting you up for success. They're, they're telling you no to things for a reason. Find out why. Ask why. Learn about where the dangers are in different things. And decide now, like Daniel that you are not going to allow yourself to be defiled. I don't run into very many people my age or older who say, oh, you know what? I wish I just lived in sin. I missed out on all that. I don't run into a lot of people like that. 
But I run into people who have regrets in the opposite way all the time. I wish I hadn't done that. What we are all telling you is to make the determination now you're not going to do that and save yourself of that regret. We only have one life to live. You need to make it count. You need to make the most of it. You need to live a life without regrets. And you need to determine that you're going to be a spiritual success. Now the things that we've talked about in this hour this morning, these are things that can be done at any time. It's never too late to start seeking a personal relationship with God. Is it? It's never too late to start learning what God's will is and doing it and trying to teach it to others. It's never too late to start telling yourself no and, and, and cutting yourself off from the sinful things of this world. But young people, if you'll make the commitment, the determination to do it now, you'll be way ahead of the game. You'll be setting yourselves up for spiritual success. I've enjoyed the time that I've been with you this week. I've enjoyed getting to know you and I leave here excited for this congregation and excited about what the future holds for this congregation. But I'm very interested in you young people and seeing what you turn into and seeing how you accept the challenge of being an adult, getting into adulthood as a follower of Christ, as a Christian. I'm excited, I'm excited to see your success in your life. Thank you so very much for the careful attention you've given to the things that we've had to study. I'll give you a couple of minutes, I guess. I may take them in the next hour. We'll see. But thank you very much. Appreciate it.